Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President and I are very pleased to welcome you to our press conference. We will now report on the outcome of today's meeting, uh, meeting of the Governing Council. Based on our regular economic and monetary analysis, we have conducted a thorough assessment of the economic and inflation outlook, also taking into account the latest staff macroeconomic projections for the euro area. As a result, the Governing Council took the following decisions in pursuit of its price stability mandate. First, as regards the key ECB interest rates, we decided to lower the interest rate on the deposit facility by 10 basis points to minus 0.50%. The interest rate on the main refinancing operations and the rate on the marginal lending facility will remain unchanged at the current levels of 0 and 0.25% respectively. We now expect the key ECB interest rates to remain at the present or lower levels until we have seen the inflation outlook robustly converge to a level sufficiently close to but below 2% within our projection horizon and such convergence has been consistently reflected in underlying inflation dynamics. Second, the Governing Council decided to restart net purchases under its asset purchase program at a monthly pace of 20 billion euro as from November 1st. We expect them to run for as long as necessary to reinforce the accommodative impact of our policy rates and to end shortly before we start raising the key ECB interest rates. Third, we intend to continue reinvesting in full the principal payments from maturing securities purchased under the asset purchase program for an extended period of time past the date when we start raising the key ECB interest rates, and in any case for as long as necessary to maintain favorable liquidity conditions and an ample degree of monetary accommodation. Fourth, we decided to change the modalities of the new series of quarterly targeted longer-term refinancing operations, TELTRO 3, to preserve favorable bank lending conditions, ensure the smooth transmission of monetary policy, and further support the accommodative stance of monetary policy. The interest rate in each operation will now be set at the level of the average rate applied in the Euro system's main refinancing operations over the life of the respective TELTRO. For banks whose eligible net lending exceeds a benchmark, the rate applied in TELTRO 3 operations will be lower and can be as low as the average interest rate on the deposit facility prevailing over the life of the operation. The maturity of the operations will be extended from two to three years. Fifth, in order to support the bank-based transmission of monetary policy, the Governing Council decided to introduce a two-tier system for reserve remuneration in which part of banks' holdings of excess liquidity will be exempt from the negative deposit facility rate. Separate press releases with further details of the measures taken by the Governing Council will be published this afternoon at 3.30 p.m. The Governing Council reiterated the need for a highly accommodative stance of monetary policy for a prolonged period of time 
and continues to stand ready to adjust all of its instruments as appropriate to ensure that inflation moves towards its aim in a sustained manner, in line with its commitment to symmetry. Today's decisions were taken in response to the continued shortfall of inflation with respect to our aim. In fact, in coming information since the last Governing Council meeting indicates a more protracted weakness of the euro area economy, the persistence of prominent downside risks and muted inflationary pressures. This is reflected in the new staff projections, which show a further downgrade of the inflation outlook. At the same time, Robust employment growth and increasing wages continue to underpin the resilience of the euro area economy. With today's comprehensive package of monetary policy decisions, we are providing substantial monetary stimulus to ensure that financial conditions remain very favorable and support the euro area expansion, the ongoing build up of domestic price pressures and thus the sustained convergence of inflation to our medium term inflation aim. Let me now explain our assessment in greater detail, starting with the economic analysis. Euro area real GDP increased by 0.2% quarter on quarter in the second quarter of 2019, following a rise of 0.4% in the previous quarter. Incoming economic data and survey information continue to point to moderate but positive growth in the third quarter of this year. This slowdown in growth mainly reflects the prevailing weakness in inter of international trade in an environment of prolonged global uncertainties which are particularly affecting the euro area manufacturing sector. At the same time, the services and construction sectors show ongoing resilience and the euro area expansion is also supported by favorable financing conditions, further employment gains and rising wages. The mildly expansionary euro area fiscal stance and the ongoing, albeit somewhat slower, growth in global activity. This assessment is broadly reflected in the September 2019 ECB staff macroeconomic projections for the euro area. These projections foresee annual real GDP increasing by 1.1 in 2019, 1.2 in 2020, 1.4 in 2021. Compared with the June 2019 staff macroeconomic projections, the outlook for real GDP growth has been revised down for 2019 and 2020. The risks surrounding the euro area growth outlook remain tilted to the downside. These risks mainly pertain to the prolonged presence of uncertainties related to geopolitical factors, the rising threat of protectionism, and vulnerabilities in emerging markets. According to Eurostat's flash estimate, Euro area annual HICP inflation was 1% in August 2019, unchanged from July. Lower energy inflation was offset by higher food inflation. While the rate of HICP inflation excluding food and energy was unchanged. On the basis of current futures prices of for oil, headline inflation is likely to decline before rising again towards the end of the year. Measures of underlying inflation remained generally muted, and indicators of inflation expectations stand at low levels. 
While labor cost pressures strengthened and broadened amid high levels of capacity utilization and tightening labor markets, their pass-through to inflation is taking longer than previously anticipated. Over the medium term, underlying inflation is expected to increase, supported by our monetary policy measures, the ongoing economic expansion, and robust wage growth. This assessment is also broadly reflected in the September 2019 ECB staff macroeconomic projections for the euro area, which foresee annual HICP inflation at 1.2 this year, 1 in 2020, and 1.5 in 2021. Compared with the June 20, 2019 staff macroeconomic projections, the outlook for HICP inflation is being revised down over the whole projection horizon, reflecting lower energy prices and the weaker growth environment. Turning to the monetary analysis, broad money, M3, growth increased to 5.2% in July after 4.5% in June. Sustained rates of broad money growth reflect ongoing bank credit creation for the private sector and low opportunity costs of holding M3. The narrow monetary aggregate M1 continues to be the main contributor to broad money growth on the components side. The annual growth rate of loans to non-financial corporations remained unchanged at 3.9% in July 2019. The annual growth rate of overall loans to non-financial corporations continues to be solid, although short-term loans, which are more sensitive to the cycle, show signs of weakness. The annual growth rate of loans to households stood at 3.4 in July after 3.3 in June, continuing its gradual improvement. Overall, loan growth is still benefiting from historically low bank lending rates. The monetary policy measures we've taken today, including the more accommodative terms of the new series of Teltros, will help to safeguard favorable bank lending conditions and will continue to support access to financing, in particular for small and medium-sized enterprises. <clears throat> to sum up, a cross-check of the outcome of the economic analysis with the signals coming from the monetary analysis confirmed that an ample degree of monetary accommodation is still necessary for the continued sustained convergence of inflation to levels that are below but close to 2% over the medium term. In order to reap the full benefits from our monetary policy measures, other policy areas must contribute more decisively to raising the longer term growth potential. Supporting aggregate demand at the current juncture and reducing vulnerabilities. The implementation of structural policies in the euro area countries needs to be substantially stepped up to boost euro area productivity and growth potential, reduce structural unemployment and increase resilience. The 2019 country specific recommendations should serve as the relevant signpost. Regarding fiscal policies, the mildly expansionary euro area fiscal stance is currently providing some support to economic activity. In view of the weakening economic outlook and the continued prominence of downside risks, governments with fiscal space should act in an effective and timely manner. In countries where public debt is high, governments need to pursue prudent policies that will create the conditions for automatic stabilizers to operate freely. 
All countries should reinforce their efforts to achieve a more growth-friendly composition of public finances. Likewise, the transparent and consistent implementation of the European Union's fiscal and economic governance framework over time and across countries remains essential to bolster the resilience of the euro area economy, improving the functioning of economic and monetary union remains a priority. The Governing Council welcomes the ongoing work and urges further specific and decisive steps to complete the Banking Union and the Capital Markets Union. And now we are at your disposal for questions. Mr. Skolimowski. Uh, Piotr Skolimowski, Bloomberg. Um, Good afternoon, Mr. President. Good afternoon. Um, the question, my first question would be about um, the dynamic in the room, because going into the meeting, we've seen quite a vocal opposition, especially to the restarting of the QE. So probably me and, and the others here would like to know how much support each of the uh, instruments that were eventually adopted got and whether um, how much support was there for it. My second question is specifically about um, your APP program because it's effectively a program that's open-ended. It starts from November, um, which basically means you, you will end up buying bonds or assets uh, for months or years. Um, the question is, do you have the space to do it? Have you considered changing limits or adding other assets to the program? Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I can, before giving you the uh, sort of the chemistry of the meeting, let me just spend a word trying to uh, explain what we have actually done. I think, uh, as I kind of sketched in the introductory statements, uh, there were three elements that prompt action, prompted action. Uh, a, along lines, by the way, that uh, you would find in my Sintra speech. Uh, first of all, uh, after, and again, if anything, after Sintra, the case became even stronger because the protracted slowdown in the Eurozone economy is uh, actually more marked than expected, and this is the first element. The second element is the persistent and the persistence of downside risks of trade nature, but also geopolitical nature in the Eurozone. Um, and by the way, our baseline scenario that, uh, led, that actually uh, contains the third reason for acting, namely the downward revision in uh, projected inflation with the inflation expectations at this low level and the current underlying inflation being muted, this baseline scenario is also relatively favorable because it doesn't contain the case of a hard Brexit, for example, the probability of which has gone up over recent time. And it doesn't contain the, some of the trade uh, uh, measures, trade escalation at least, some of the trade escalation that's taken place since August. So in this, uh, with this relatively favorable uh, baseline scenario, there was a downgrade in inflation and inflation expectations. Uh, and so that's over the whole horizon. And that's what prompted the measures we've taken. And let me just spend a word explaining them and then I will answer your, uh, your points more specifically. First of all, the lowering of the DFR, the deposit facility rate, together with the reinforced forward guidance, operates all throughout the yield curve, especially in the short and the medium term segments. And then you see that there is a different forward guidance today. It's a strengthened state dependent. There is no more calendar dependence. And this, will pro this should give a pretty good guidepost, pretty clear guidepost for rate expectations by linking our policy to more stringent conditions for the inflation outlook. Over our projection horizon, projected inflation will not only need now to converge, but also, as I think I read in the introductory statement, also stabilize around a level sufficiently close to but below 
The reference to levels sufficiently close to but below 2% signals that we want to see projected inflation to significantly increase from the current realized and projected inflation figures, which are well below the levels that we consider to be in line with our aim. Our guidance would remain forward-looking, but at the same time, it contains elements that uh, are protect us against the risk of overreacting to transitory shocks of inflation, as well as against forecast and measurement errors, as we would emphasize that convergence should be robust. That's important. And also important is the reference to underlying inflation that will have to increase to ensure that the pickup in inflation is backed by a sustained buildup of domestic price pressures. I think that's the explanation of the first uh, few elements of, uh, of today's decision. Um, now, the, I, can, I can also give you an explanation of why the restarting of the APP is appropriate, but we can defer this to the next question, perhaps. And let me now move to the other, to the other point. Your first question was about uh, the chemistry of the meeting. Let me start, from, first of all, let me start from one thing about there was unanimous, unanimity, unanimous consensus, unanimity, namely that fiscal policy should become the main instrument. It's, it's, quite, it's quite clear that in order to raise demand in an effective and time, and that's, have you seen the language of the introductory statement after many years, I think, of being more or less the same about fiscal policy, now it's changed. And uh, I think there was uh, complete agreement about that. And if you see, also, if you compare what's happening in other jurisdictions where inflation rates are higher, and you look at monetary policies are broadly comparable in terms of easing capacity, you see that fiscal policy did play in these jurisdictions a much more active role than it played. And I'm talking now not only about this year, last year, I'm talking about the last six, seven years. All the, or almost all the things that you see in Europe, the creation of more than 11 million jobs over a short period of time, the recovery, the sustained growth for several quarters, were by and large produced by our monetary policy. There was very little else. Of course, there were structural reforms in some countries, in some countries. So now it's high time, I think, for the fiscal policy to take, uh, to take charge. Uh, second, uh, there was a broad agreement on the parts concerning forward guidance and, um, and the rate cut and the reinvestment and the Teltro. So you can see that uh, that part was, by and large, uh, agreed. Um, and then there was, of course, more diversity of views, as it was vastly pre-announced by statements on all uh, newspapers, wires, uh, television, and so on. There was, uh, there was more diversity of views on APP. But then in the end, uh, there was, uh, it was, uh, the consensus was so broad, there was no need to take a vote. So the decision was, uh, in the end, um, uh, showed a, a, a very broad consensus. As I said, there was no need to take a vote. There was a clear, so, such a clear majority that. Uh, so let me now say one word about where the main differences actually lied in the discussion. I think there was, uh, uh, again, a full agreement about the need to act. But uh, the difference of views were about the severity of the outlook. Uh, in other words, the majority of the governing council uh, believed that uh, the outlook was deteriorating uh, in, a, as I said, in a way uh, uh, greater than expected. And the revision in the uh, growth and inflation projections granted, uh, granted uh, full action. Others viewed this deterioration with, uh, with a little more caution. Uh, second point was about the need to act now. Uh, as usual, you have always uh, views that say, let's wait and see. 
and the governing council decided to act now this time. And the third uh, is about the appropriateness of the, of the APP. Uh, by the way, one reason also to act now concerns inflation expectations that we've seen, not only the ones that are now at low levels, but we see that inflation expectations are not de-anchoring, but are re-anchoring at levels between zero and one and a half percent, which is not our aim. That's, what, uh, that's why the Governing Council, in full consistency with its mandate, did decide to act now. And it's now, uh, and the package is quite powerful, both in the short run, but also in the long run, on, uh, on, uh, in, in designing action over the coming, over the coming months. Um, so the appropriateness of these instruments, because some think that these the APP is appropriate only for risk of, risks of deflation, Others thought that the inter level of interest rates is already so low that it doesn't need action on the front of, on the APP. Uh, but the majority of the governing council believed that uh, action was warranted. And um, and um, so that's that was the the chemistry basically. Um, now the limits. Uh, the limit. The, there was no appetite frankly, to discuss uh, the limits for one good reason, because we have a relevant headroom to go on for quite a long time at this rhythm without the need to raise the, uh, the discussion about limits. I think I uh, will stop here. Ms. Weisbach. Annette Weisbach, CNBC. Um, let me take your point on the length of the program and also how long you think those measures are needed. Because I think one of the surprising elements of the proposed um, package was that it, the APP comes in with an unlimited amount of time, right? So what are you expecting? How long does this need to prevail in order to really get inflation back to target? And in your experience, how uh, how much yeah, effort does the central bank need to do in order to re-anchor inflation back at where you want to have it? And then another question is, did you discuss also to move the marginal lending rate into negative territory? And is that an option which could be a next step? And why didn't you do it, kind of large, enlarging the corridor now? Thank you. Thank you. I mean, as far as the first question is concerned, uh, we, we, really, we really think this package is adequate. To, to re-anchor inflation expectations. And by the way, again, if I may repeat myself, if fiscal policy had been in place or would be put in place, the side effects of our monetary policy would be much less, the action of our decisions today would be much faster, and therefore the need to keep in place some of these measures would be less. So we believe this, uh, this package to be adequate. Um, and um, your other question was about whether we discussed, no, we didn't. We didn't discuss changing the marginal lending rates, no. Mr. Sims? Mr. Draghi, uh, going into today's meeting, how many members at the early on in the meeting were actually against quantitative easing? And um, even though you didn't take a vote in the end. And um, did you also discuss higher amounts of monthly purchases before your final decision? I'm sorry, the answer is that I can't uh, tell you the numbers. We never did it, we're not gonna do it. Just to let you know that there was no need to take a vote, as I said, because there was such a significant majority. Uh, the second point is, no, we didn't discuss it. Mr. Arnold? Can you uh, address um, this issue of how long the asset purchase program will last? Um, the markets seem to be assuming that this is QE ad infinitum. Um, can you also talk about the, um, what will the makeup of the uh, QE, the type of assets that uh, you're planning to, to, to purchase? Um, and can you also talk about helicopter money? And what's your view on um, whether there could, in the future, be a need for direct action? Okay. Um, 
the type t there was no 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 uh, discussion about the type of assets meaning that by and large it's going to be the same we purchased in the past we purchased in the past now with helicopter money i got to be very cautious because last time i was asked this about was about a year a year and a half ago i said well maybe an interesting thing but we haven't discussed and immediately everybody said oh they are talking about this and study no we are not talking it's not been discussed it's not an option that we considered Mr. Yes, Mr. President, uh, you will forgive me if I read your tweet. It's from Donald Trump. <laughs> yes, yes. I've seen, I've seen it. Yeah, some minutes ago. He tweeted like, um, European Central Bank acting quickly cuts rates 10 basis points. They are trying and succeeding in depreciating the euro against a very strong dollar. It's all capital letters. Hurting U.S. exports. And the Fed sits and sits and sits. They, pay, they get paid to borrow money while we are paying interest. So I would like you maybe to comment this. And second, uh, you know that in Germany there is a very strong discussion about uh, banks and negative rates on deposits and their intention to uh, transfer these negative rates on retail clients. Uh, I wanted to know if you have an opinion on this. And um, so that's my two questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, the first question, uh, I, in a sense, answered to the first question on the occasion of the first Twitter. Um, and the answer is very simple. We have a mandate. We pursue price stability, and we don't target exchange rates, period. On, uh, on negative rates, I think today uh, the, the um, I have said several times negative rates has been a, have been have been a, a quite very actually a very positive experience in terms of stimulating uh, stimulating sustaining stimulating growth sustaining inflation um, but it's quite clear and I did say this several times that they have side effects and they have negative side effects. And uh, it's not so much that we want to protect bank profits. That's not, uh, certainly not our mandate. But it's that we want to protect the smooth transmission of, a, of the lending channel. We should never forget that um, the European economy is a bank-based economy, that lending goes through banks. And we want to protect the transmission of our monetary policy through the lending channels. And I think that's the, uh, I should say, the philosophy behind the tiering measures, the mitigating measures that we have discussed and approved today. Thank you. Mr. Stumpf. Hi, Mr. President. I would like to know the different uh, options uh, that the Eurosystem committees that were tasked to uh, brought to the to the governing council. Thank you. I'm sorry. Which, which different options? I mean, besides the one uh, adopted. I think we 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 don't discuss. Uh, by the way, we when we have our discussions, we discuss the uh, presentation uh, of the chief economist the proposal of the chief economist. And this proposal did not contain options. It was what is being, I just read in the introductory statement and I commented about. Thank you. Mr. Reino. Good afternoon, President Draghi. There is a growing consensus to change the rules of the stability pact and the concern that brought, pushed you to change, uh, to restart uh, a stimulus. Uh, will, uh, does it, this mean that you join this uh, consensus? And second question, because the inflation expectation seems uh, anchored to a different target of yours, would you, consider, would you support the view expressed also by your successor, Christine Lagarde, to review the inflation targets. Thanks. Thank you. Um, no, we made the case for fiscal policy to uh, sustain demand, and we're making the case, and we'll make this case on and on more, even more frequently in the in the in the coming future. This for the. We actually didn't discuss the, if you, if you read, the, we didn't discuss the stability pact, and as a matter of fact, we have a sentence here 
that says exactly that uh, the transparent and consistent implementation of the European Union's fiscal and economic governance framework over time and across countries remains essential to bolster the resilience of the euro area economy. Uh, having said that, countries that have fiscal space, and we say this, should act in, a, in an effective and timely manner, if I'm not mistaken. Let me see. Uh, governments with fiscal pace should act in an effective and timely manner. Exactly. In view of the weakening economic outlook and the continued prominence of downside risks. In countries where public debt is high, governments need to pursue prudent policies that will create the conditions for automatic stabilizers to operate freely. So the Stability and Growth Pact discussion is essentially a discussion between member states and the Commission. And uh, that's what uh, that's what the state that's that's these are the statements uh, that uh, that uh, we can make today. Now uh, the other question was about. Oh no! The, well, that's yeah yeah. The other question is whether we can. Uh, this again, it was a question that had been asked many times. You can imagine over these years. Um, and by the way, you have two different camps here. The ones who say, listen, given that you are still kind of far from, say, 1.9, whatever is our aim, why don't you cheerfully and happily accept 1% as an objective so you can claim victory? Uh, now, that, that is, uh, uh, that is uh, a, an issue that, uh, that we always rejected. There is another camp that says, if you raise your objective to 4%, people will believe you and their expectations will go up. Uh, I don't want to prejudge. By the way, all this will be the topic of the strategic review that the next president will carry out together with the governing council. The reasons why we, uh, during my tenure, we always uh, objected to changing the target uh, by the way, the reasons are different whether you go up or you go down. But there is one common reason, that when you change a target that you can't reach, the action is not very credible. If you can't reach two, why do you want to go to four? And, if you, and, and on the other hand, to change uh, the, the, other, the other side would have other drawbacks. And so for a variety of reasons, so we've always refrained from, from changing this. But this, as I said, is going to be uh, one of the topics of this strategic review. Ms. Laird. Thank you. I've got two questions, Mr. Draghi. The first is, your, the asset, pass, uh, asset purchase program was a little bit more hawkish than private economists expected. Your forward guidance was a little bit more dovish. Is that aimed at giving your, uh, your successor maximum flexibility, including on uh, rejigging or reconsidering any kind of purchase limits? The second question, if you'll forgive me, if we could go back to the uh, tweeter in chief. Would any uh, effort by the U.S. to directly or indirectly weaken the dollar complicate your goals? And would you have any specific reaction planned should the U.S. intervene to weaken the dollar? Um, the answer to the first question is that we, we take our decisions really not with the idea, not, not with the idea of creating uh, the uh, a, a kind of a ground for my successor, but we've, we've taken our decisions, as I said at the beginning, on the basis of objective elements that have to do with the weakening uh, of uh, the uh, economic outlook, uh, a weakening that is uh, uh, more serious than expected, and uh, with the revision in uh, the inflation projections and uh, with the persistence of uncertainty so that, these are the elements at the basis of our, of our, of our decisions today. Um, now, on the second question, uh, you know, we stick with the, G, with the G20 consensus, namely that uh, we, we don't, uh, we will never pursue competitive devaluation. So we expect that all the G20 members would underwrite the same consensus. Okay. 
Mr. Wiebe. Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. I was uh, quite surprised that a lot of economists who didn't talk that way and in the past are now changing their opinion and are questioning whether the side effects of, of the monetary policy, the negative side effects, will uh, some, sometimes very soon be bigger than the benefits. So do you see any point in the future where this could happen? I, I think that um, this uh, concern is very well, very well placed. I think we should be aware of the side effects of our policies, be there interest rates or asset purchases, and um, the and we are monitoring. We are we are closely monitoring the side effects. The vice president, through its financial stability action, is uh, closely monitoring uh, all these effects. So we are, we are keenly aware. Now, to, to many of these side effects, uh, the answer is not to change monetary policy, but rather implement specific macroprudential policies. Uh, but, but as I said, this is a const, it's been a constant, a constant point of action, constant point of concern. Ms. Bufaki? Um, Isabella Bufaki from Sole 24 Ore. I have two questions. One is on one of the actions today on Taltros, because there um, has been, I think, more than the market expected. They're longer, and there is not a 10 basis point on the top. And um, this is even before the Taltros are, are in place. So is there a worry, preoccupation that loans are not really going to, especially SMEs? And then my second question is on uh, um, this statement on uh, effective and timely manner for government with fiscal space. Uh, today, a very important think tank in Germany saw a recession on the horizon of Germany. And what is your view on the risk of recession? And do you think that a country should act before it has a recession rather than wait to have it to change the fiscal policy? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, when we approved, the first question is about Teltros. When we approved the Teltros, basically, the, if, I, if I remember correctly, there were two, uh, two uh, criteria. The first was to ensure that uh, our monetary policy would be transmitted through the bank lending channel. And the second would be that those conditions would be dependent on the macroeconomic outlook which has worsened since we approved the Teltros. Therefore, there has been an adjustment in the Teltros conditions. Um, the second point is about uh, recession. We, we, think, we still think the uh, probability of a recession for the euro area is small, but it's gone up. Uh, but still, we believe it's still uh, a small probability. While with respect to Germany as such, well, we've seen today two, uh, two uh, business cycles institutes uh, saying that it's either a recession already or they foresee a clear recession or it's about to get into a recession. I, I'm not, uh, and, um, and so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a case, but that's a case for a timely and effective action on the, on the fiscal policy side. By the way, let me, let me say something I've said many times. Um, it's in a sense easy to make recommendations to uh, governments uh, to do this and to do that. So in doing so, and you know this, I've said this many times, we've got to be extremely humble. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, something that we should say because the instruments ought to be activated. As I said, everybody was unanimous about that today. Uh, but we should also be aware that there are objective and uh, specific difficulties about doing this in different countries, by the way. Mr. Boindaman. 
Thank you. Um, this is a follow-up question to one of the questions of my colleagues about um, negative side effects. Uh, your proposed successor, Christine Lagarde, also said in the European Parliament she, she wants to look more closer at the concerns of citizens about the negative side effects of uh, the ECB's accommodative uh, monetary policy. And uh, one of such side effects is, of course, the severe uh, pressure uh, on pension funds through continuing low rates. Um, it seems increasingly likely that large Dutch pension funds will have to cut pay payouts. Um, so were the pension funds discussed at the meeting today? And is there, uh, in your view, um, a risk that monetary policy actually harms um, d demand since people will have less money in their pockets? Thank you. Thank you. The, the, the answer to the last point is no. Uh, we haven't seen that. Uh, but uh, we, we, we certainly are very concerned about uh, the pension and, uh, and the related services industry. Uh, and, uh, and certainly this is one of the side effects. Having said that, it's quite clear that to the extent that negative rates prompt or speed up the recovery, they will also benefit pension funds and insurance companies. So and, uh, the, the, the main point here, here is really um, negative rates are necessary instrument of monetary policy, and this is what the governing council has stated now for quite a long time. It has created a lot of positive effects. How do we speed up these effects so that interest rates can go up again? And the answer is once again is fiscal policy at this point. By the way, as a matter of fact, the, I understand the Dutch government has a 50 billion investment program, and that's, uh, that's, a, good, uh, that's a good time to activate it. Thank you. Mr. Heiden, please. Luke Heiden, Market News. Um, Mr. Draghi, can you say a little bit more about the motive for making the duration of the asset purchase program contingent on the first uh, rate hike? Um, and my second question was, you said that interest rates will remain at their present or lower levels until inflation not only converges, uh, but stabilizes. Was the possibility or the desirability of inflation stabilizing temporarily above 2% discussed? Um, would you be against that? And if so, why? Thank you. The answer to the second question is actually was not discussed. So we really stuck with that definition and uh, with the aim as, be, as it has been expressed. And the symmetry means that we react to inflation rates that are below our aim with uh, the same strength we would react to inflation rates which are above our aim. Uh, it seems obvious, but uh, evidently it needed to be restated. and um, and. So uh, now, concerning the asset purchase program, uh, let me just say a few things. First of all, it has a larger impact on longer term rates and provides further support to the funding costs that matter for business and households. Also, the, uh, with this formulation, the horizon of net purchases dynamically adjusts to changes in our interest rate forward guidance and therefore works in the background to keep a lid on medium to longer term interest rates. So you see the two instruments interact together. By adding to the stock of assets and reinvesting for longer, we can postpone an undue tightening in term premia, which mechanically occurs as the APP's portfolio loses average duration. In addition, APP net purchases have, str have strong signaling effects and wealth effects on the balance sheets of banks and other entities. And the APP tends to have a more powerful effect on the formation of inflation expectations by demonstrating our commitment to use all instruments in pursuit of our aim. You, you remember me saying this, that all instruments were on the table, that were all ready to be used. Well, today we did it. 
Mr. Rasch. Michael Rasch, Neue Zürcher Zeitung. Mr. President, uh, again on the side effects, uh, was there today uh, in the Council a longer discussion about the proportionality of the program given the uh, possible side effects? And uh, which side effects are concerning you personally most? Thank you. The, um, there was certainly a discussion about the proportionality, but it did not concern so much the negative rates. In other words, the consensus was, I would say, very, very, very broad on the negative, on cutting the rates. So the proportionality discussion was mostly focused on the, on the restarting of APP, where frankly the side effects are uh, less visible. They may be there, but they are less visible than, uh, than cutting the rates for the reasons that we have discussed before. Mr. Yakish? I'm sorry, you asked another question? Oh, well, I, I think I expressed that before. I, the, uh, we should not, I mean, we should be very aware of these side effects. In fact, one of the answers we have is that with the tiering measures that we've, we've uh, we approved today, we're trying to uh, protect the transmission of our monetary policy through the bank lending channel from some side effects that the negative rates might have. That's one example of answers. Of course, there are many other side effects we should be aware that go beyond banks, as it was uh, asked to me a moment ago. Thank you. Mr. Jakic. Klaus Anna Jakic, ARD German Television. Mr. President, I also would like to touch uh, on the decrease of the deposit uh, facility rate. Um, I do very well understand that the governing council is not too much interested in the profitability of the banking system. But on the other hand, aren't you um, concerned that, uh, that there is maybe a lack of confidence in the population when it gets uh, in, in the lack of confidence in the ECB of the population, if it gets a feeling that uh, parts of the costing of the financial crisis are more and more shifted to them? And the second question, as you are aware, um, uh, the CEO, CEO uh, of the Deutsche Bank recently said on, um, on a conference that if the ECB is continuing uh, this um, type of um, money poli policy, um, it may lead or will lead um, to a destabilization or a collapse of the financial system. What do you say uh, to this uh, comment? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh First, the first question: We are, we certainly are aware of the of the side effects, the negative side effects on the people, especially in those parts of the eurozone where the negative rates are being passed to corporate. So far, as far as I understand, it's corporate depositors, and it's uh, but it's it's an increasing percentage of them that is actually doing so. So we are we are concerned, and part of the reasoning uh, about this is uh, again which has to do with the transmission of our monetary policy. Part of the reasons why we approve the tiering measures today, the mitigating measures, is also to try to soften, to reduce this transfer of costs to, uh, to, uh, to the borrowers, to the borrowers. But we should be ultimately uh, confident that uh, with the recovery and the restarting of the anchoring of the inflation to our aim, the interest rates will go up at that point. People should explain that negative interest rates are a necessity, and that's very important. And I think the trust in the ECB ultimately will be based on whether it's delivered on its mandate of price stability or not. It has delivered on a variety of fronts, as I said before, more than 11 million jobs being created in uh, in uh, in a few years, and uh, and I've, I'm pretty sure. I mean, the, and the German citizens certainly benefited from the ECB monetary policy for a long time and quite significantly. Now, the second point is about the comments made that negative rates negative rates are clearly we, we I mean it's, it's something banks would like to have positive rates unquestionably. So whenever they have negative rates, they don't like it. But I wouldn't go as far as saying that negative rates will cause the collapse of the financial system, because before getting there, 
one has to look at other things of our banks. For example, the cost-income ratio. Many of our banks have cost-income ratios which are completely way off any average indicator, both in Europe and even more so in the world, if compared with other banks in the other parts of the world. Uh, there are certain structural weaknesses in the banking sector, more pronounced in certain parts of the Eurozone than in others. I think these, these sort of considerations affect much more than negative rates, banks' profitability, banks' capacity to lend. The necessity to adjust the business model to the digitalization, to the change in, changes in technology, is something much more compelling than uh, uh, being angry about negative rates. Thank you. Mr. Pellino. Rino Pellino from Rai, Italian Television. Mr. President, uh, actually Germany is the, the country that has most, the biggest uh, play role to make fis expensive fiscal policies. Uh, Italy on the other side is a country that would make boost the, the, the expenditure but has uh, the necessity to uh, consolidate the, the situation. How do you think that the package that you decided today can be useful for both these uh, so different situations? Well, I must confess we, we, we haven't discussed this side of the usefulness of our package for one good reason, that our package is not meant to finance government deficits. Our package would be in full respect of the treaty which forbids monetary financing. So our objective is price stability, and we want to deliver on our mandate. Uh, so the, whether, whether which country would benefit, which country would be, would be more comfortable with, uh, with the present package was not an issue of discussion today. Thank you. Well, final question goes to Mr. Hewing. Uh, thank you, Jack Hewing, New York Times. Um, two questions, one on a fiscal policy. Uh, you've obviously put a lot of emphasis on that today. Are, are you maybe sending a message to governments that you know it's their time to step up to the plate and the ECB is, is not gonna come to the rescue forever? And then uh, a related question. Um, you may be aware of a, a paper that was published by BlackRock uh, recently uh, one of the authors was uh, Stanley Fisher, your thesis advisor, which called for central banks to start thinking about uh, putting money, central bank money, directly in the hands of, of citizens. And I heard your answer earlier to helicopter money, but if governments don't step up to the plate, isn't that something that the ECB needs to consider? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, the first question is uh, definitely yes. And, uh, and the second question, um, it, you know, all, all these um, innovations in, uh, in monetary policy uh, need to be looked at and studied and thought over. Uh, it's, these are big, big changes in the way monetary policy works. And we have not discussed this. Uh, they may be part of this strategic review in the future. But, uh, but at this present point, uh, the Governing Council never discussed. Uh, uh, you, well, you've seen how cautious we've been in uh, not, and by the way, and in the end, we decided not to change the inflation target for many years. And uh, so now these are momentous changes in the way uh, not only monetary policy, but the whole economy is supposed to work. Also, uh, let's keep in mind all the times that giving money to people in whatever form, it's a fiscal policy task. It's not monetary policy task. Thank you.